This is 1A. I'm Jen White. If you live near a bustling downtown or shopping center, you may have noticed an increase in private security guards in the last couple of years. Even places like hospitals, neighborhoods, and the occasional corner gas station have turned to hiring their own security. According to the New York Times, most major cities now have at least three times as many security guards as police officers on the street. In just the past couple of weeks, private security guards began patrolling areas in Austin, Texas, and Raleigh, North Carolina. This uptick comes as police departments across the country struggle with recruitment and as police response times rise in many cities. But as more private security takes the place of police, so do concerns over training, regulation, and accountability. This trend can also lead to inequality as safety and peace of mind are granted only to those who can afford it. To talk about it all, let's bring in our panel. Rick McCann is the CEO of Private Officer International. That's an association for security and law enforcement professionals. He's also a police officer with 45 years in law enforcement and is a security company owner himself. Rick, welcome to the program. Thank you for having me. Also with us is Alana Simuels. She's an economic correspondent with Time and wrote a three-part series on the private security industry. Alana, it's great to have you. Thanks for having me. Later in the hour, we talk with a parent who hired private security for students living near Temple University and an activist in North Carolina who's pushing back on the city of Raleigh for hiring armed private guards. But first, let's dig into some of the basics, Alana, starting with the number of private security guards we're seeing in the U.S. What does the increase of security guards actually look like? So there are about twice as many security guards employed in the U.S. as there were 20 years ago, according to the Security Industry Association. Um, And the population of the U.S. has only grown 16% over the same time period. So that's a pretty big increase compared to how many more people we have. Um, And in 2021, there's some data that suggests there are three security guards for every 1,000 people, but only two police officers. We got this email from David in Florida who says the number of private security firms has increased dramatically. My question is this, why? What has happened in our society that we need so much more protection? Do other countries have a similar increase or is this our own illness? Rick, what are you hearing from people who turn to your company about why they're turning to private security? As you have mentioned, uh, Right now, with the status of law enforcement shortages, uh, there's a rise in violent crime and property crimes. Uh, Many people are having to um, employ their own security and really not depend as much on law enforcement. Alana, what have you found in your reporting? Yeah, same. I think there's both... You know, in some some areas, there's increased crime, and there's also a perception of there being more crime. You know, whether or not the the data bear that out, I think especially since 2020 and the pandemic, a lot of people feel like they can't depend on the police to come right when they call them. There might be some time, um, and so they're taking matters into their own hands. David had also asked whether other countries have a similar increase. And Alana, I don't know that you've reported on what's happening globally, though some of the private security firms do have a global presence. But is this a U.S. specific issue to your knowledge? I don't think it is. I mean, I don't I don't think in places like Europe, for instance, there are as many private security, but in places like Africa, um, some nations where maybe the police forces aren't as developed. I know, you know, writing about one of the world's biggest companies, they certainly have members and employees all over the world. Now, the use of private security is pretty widespread. Alana, what's the range of people and in, in places turning to their own guards? Yeah, it was surprising to me to find how many different types of people. You have things like transit agencies and cities like Beverly Hills, California, but then you have just neighborhood groups, um, gas station owners. I talked to a guy who said a man hired private security to take his kids to the movies because he was worried about their safety at the movies. Um, so I think you have a lot of people who maybe wouldn't have thought about this a couple of years ago, um, thinking about this as a, as a real option as they, as they feel less safe. Well, we're hearing from some of you One text member shares, I'm a private security contractor with the Department of Homeland Security to protect federal buildings. In the case of my job, there are higher standards than your typical retail security guard as we have to qualify for security clearance. Rick, what are some of the more surprising or maybe lesser known uses of private security? 
Well, first of all, I want to clarify a couple of things. As though, I mean, even though this kind of looks like a sudden trend, private security has been around for more than 125 years. And Pinkerton, a well-known company, was one of the more prevalent ones. But security has been used for everything from guarding the president of the U.S. to securing uh, low-income housing. Security nationwide continues to grow because... As Alana said, there's a perception of more crime, and in some cases, there are more crimes. But the other thing that's not well known by the public is that many law enforcement over the last five years has reduced the type of calls that they respond to. They no longer respond to low-level crimes because they don't have the manpower. So if you were to call about a man loitering, police in your neighborhood may not respond. Uh, I know of several departments who have deleted 42 different types of responses and 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 other agencies have done the same. And so what does that mean for places where we may see the use of more private security where that wasn't the case before? So especially in um, residential communities, business communities, um, more companies have band together to hire their own security uh, for trespassing, minor crimes, um, and just to give their customers a, a sense of security. Well, Alana, you write about Allied Universal. It's the world's largest security company and also the U.S.'s third largest employer. That was in 2021. And the New York Times writes that this is the fastest growing industry in the country. What can you tell us about the size of these companies in the industry and how fast it's growing? Yeah, it's a very interesting industry because you do have a lot of small players, but they tend to get eaten up by the bigger players. I actually had a friend whose family owned a small security company, and they said that's kind of the dream to get acquired um, because there's there's money in it. Um, so a lot of the really big companies dominate some, some of the big employers, and this is kind of the more service-level jobs that don't take a lot of training, or they, they consider them service-level jobs. There are a lot of smaller security companies you know, that do train their workers and the people are perhaps former law enforcement. But the ones that you're likely to see on the street or, you know, when you're going about your daily life are probably employed by the really big companies like Allied. Well, let's go to our voicemail box. We got this message from Julie in Florida, a former security officer. I think it's important for the public to know that we are very specifically trained to not get involved with any illegal activity that's going on. We are only trained to watch, observe, call the police, and then report on what we have seen. We cannot actually intervene in any way. We are not supposed to. In fact, we are strongly urged and threatened not to. So I think that's really important for people to know. It could be a false sense of security. We'd love to hear from you as well. If you've worked in private security, what are your thoughts on the growing industry? Or if you've had an experience with a security guard, good or bad, email us about it. 1A at WAMU.org. We got this message from Gwen in San Diego who says, I'm almost 80. When I came out of my credit union with cash, I noticed some people in the parking lot and asked the guard if he would provide protection if anyone approached or threatened me. He said no, and that all he could do was report any incidents. I hope the the policies will change so that we can have armed protection when we need it. It, Rick, what is the scope of a private security guard's authority? Well, it varies. Um, The word security is generic in nature, just like bread. There's lots of different variances of bread as there is with uh, security. People lump security into everything. What the woman said, being a security officer, that was mandated by her employer, not the law. So look at nuclear security. Those are heavily armed and well-trained security officers. Look at your public safety on campuses. They, too, are more trained than the average security officer. So there are different levels of uh, training depending on both regulation and what the client or the employer requires. So there's a there's someone who's part of, say, a police force, maybe campus police, city police, what have you. And then you have someone who's employed by a private security, guard, a security firm that's uh, perhaps an extension of that force, or they're um, overseeing uh, 
let's say, a block of retail stores. For the private security that's overseeing those retail stores, so they're not employed by the city, they're not employed by a police force, what is the scope of their authority? In all states, there are both private citizens' arrest as well as uh, the authority to detain someone. And depending, again, on the client's desires, they may want them detained, such as a shoplifter, or they may want the police called. Um, The model is called observe and report, but that's just one model, depending, again, on what the, the duties and what the client wants. The customers, in many areas, dictate the level of authority that their employee or contracted person will have as well as state statutes and regulations. And Alana, very briefly, how much variation is there from state to state? Well, you know, you have what officers are told to do and then you have what happens. You know, there's an instance of an allied guard shooting and killing someone who was shoplifting in a San Francisco Walgreens, for instance. So I think you also have to remember that while there are laws, guards may not feel safe and may not follow them or may not want to follow them. We're talking to Times' Alana Samuels and Rick McCann, the CEO of Private Officer International. Coming up, we talk with a parent of a former Temple University student about her decision to hire private security around the school. I'm Jen White. This is 1A from WAMU and NPR. I'm Jen White. This is 1A. We're discussing the rise of private security guards as police departments around the country struggle to recruit officers. We're hearing from lots of you. Some people have positive reactions. One says, I feel much more at ease in public spaces with private security. And another of you shares, I had a guard help me jump my car in a downpour at 1 a.m. But a member of the 1A text club uh, writes, I no longer go to our local target, which started using a private security firm with heavily armed guards in military style uniforms, each armed with multiple firearms. My partner is a person of color and has had guards pointedly follow him halfway into the store before they return to their posts. We want to hear from you about your experiences with private security, or maybe you work in private security. Email us at 1A at WAMU.org. We're here with Rick McCann. He's the CEO of Private Officer International. That's an association for security and law enforcement professionals. He's also a police officer with 45 years in law enforcement and is a security company owner himself. Also with us is Alana Simuels. She's an economic correspondent with Time and wrote a three-part series on the private security industry. We'll talk about the regulatory environment for private security a little later, but first let's add a new voice to the conversation. Jennifer Hedberg is the mother of a former Temple University student. She hired private security to patrol about a 10-block radius of a neighborhood near the college campus. Jennifer, thanks for joining us. Oh, hi. It's my pleasure. So in 2021, you hired JNS Protection Services to patrol near the Temple University campus in Philadelphia. What led you to that decision? Well, um, it was getting pretty dicey around the campus, and there was actually um, a murder of one of the students during a carjacking. And I really expected the Temple campus to really beef up security at that time, and they didn't. And I was talking with my son one night on the phone and he said, mom, there's an actual armed robbery happening right outside my window right now. And it kind of really freaked me out. And I really didn't know what to do. So I thought, let me see if I could hire private security. And that's what I did. What, so, yeah, yeah. What, what conversations did you have with Temple or its campus police force about this decision to hire private security? Well, they weren't happy. So once they found out I did it, that's when they reached out to me and really wanted to have conversations with me. Um, But there really wasn't much they could say because they couldn't provide any more security. So they they mostly wanted to talk to me about, you know, why are you doing this? And to let me know they weren't happy about it. And what did they tell you about why they weren't able to provide additional security? 
Well, it came down to the fact that they couldn't retain people. They said, you know, we're doing our best to get new people, but we train them and then they don't stay. That was kind of the gist of it, that they couldn't retain. When you looked for a private security company, what specific role were you hoping they would play? Well, I guess for me, I was looking for marked cars to patrol the area to provide a deterrent. So in my mind, that's what I was looking for. So just to help me as a mom who was far away, feel like I, that was something that I could do to help me feel better. Did, did you have any expectation that this security firm would actually intervene if something happened? Or was it just having a visual of security being in the area? I think it was more just a visual in the area. And I don't think that they would have intervened. I think they would have to have called the police, either the Philly police or or the Temple Campus police. I'm really Um, curious how, I'm assuming you reached out to more than one security company before you contracted JNS Protection Services. What kind of response did you get? Well, uh, mostly people were not interested (laughs) because nobody had heard of this before. They kind of were like, what are you talking about? Um, No, we don't do that. So um, when I finally got to Miss Jackson at JNS, she she and I really clicked, and she thought, you know, yeah, we have to do this. This is a good idea, and we have to protect these kids. And um, it it kind of took off from there because she, she was she's really passionate about what she does. Um, but mostly the other people were just not interested. Hmm. So so this firm patrolled about a ten block radius of the neighborhood where your son lived. Did you have conversations with the parents of other students in the area? Because there's a cost associated with this. That's right. So my husband and I were able to start it up, but, you know, I want to say hundreds of parents started to donate. And then it broke off, and now there's another whole perimeter of 10 or so blocks that runs as well. And now my son has graduated and there's parents who have taken it over and it's still running. And I'm not, you know, my son's not even there anymore. And it, it runs through Facebook and um, parents are donating and it's still going. What, and, what, what kind of issues did you run into, though? I, w- I would assume that even if there were parents willing to contribute, somebody has to manage this process and manage the relationship with the security firms. What, what hurdles did you run into? Really, it ran really smoothly. Mm -hmm. You know, people donated through um, Venmo. So they just Venmo to a certain Venmo address. And then you just once, you know, whenever the uh, invoice came in, you just pay it. And then once a month, uh, JNS would send us a report about where they had been with photos and everything that had happened during the shifts. It really ran very smoothly. And who had access to that information, to those reports? Well, it would be, you know, if I, I was running it at the time, so it was me, and then I would post it to everybody. We had a private Facebook group. So anyone who was donating money, they would get access to that report. So, it was so, very transparent. So if you had a child who lived in that 10 block radius, but perhaps you couldn't afford to contribute to the security services, would you also have access to that information? Um, no, we did keep it just to the people who donated because people who um, had kids within that 10 radius block and didn't donate, they didn't really join the group. Mm. Now, your son doesn't go to Temple any longer. What's happened with the neighborhood security since? It, you said it's still running. Yep. We just hand it off to a parent who's interested and train them how to do it. And it keeps going. It keeps going, keeps growing. So I think that's fantastic. That's Jennifer Hadberg. She's the mother of a former Temple University student. Jennifer, thanks for sharing your experience with us. Yeah, that's no problem.
I want to get to this comment we got from one of you. With the continued hate toward police officers and the history of corruption, I think private security is the way to go, especially if you're concerned for your safety. Local law enforcement do not have the capacity to monitor you or a community 24-7, and you get what you pay for. And Alana, I wanted to focus in on that you get what you pay for part of the equation, because in your reporting, you look at this question of who's able to afford private security and, and what that means for community safety. That's right. You know, I, I admire what Jen did, and I think um, a lot of people feel like they have to take matters into their own hands. But I did talk to a Temple student who said, you know, I don't have a John Wick um, looking uh, looking over my shoulder, kind of referring to the to the movie. But she she felt like she you know wasn't getting uh, coverage because her she came from a family that that you know, didn't, didn't have the money to pay for it. And she actually had experience where she was walking down the street at Temple and she saw um, some kids beating up an old man. And there was a security guard standing right there from one of the big companies from Allied. And she, she stepped in and intervened, but you know, she, she did not have um, as high quality experience because the, you know, that that guard had not been trained or as well paid as, as perhaps the ones that Jennifer hired. So I think it really, does, you know, create some inequality when you have people who can pay for security guards and people who can't. You know, Rick, we heard from Jennifer that her expectation was just having the presence of the guards there as a possible deterrent. But do you think there's clarity around what a guard may be trained to do, what they're allowed to do within the law? Um, what they're being instructed to do by their employer, which may be just call the police, don't intervene. Do you think the public is really clear on that, on those boundaries? Rick, are you still with us? Oh, I'm sorry. I, I didn't I didn't hear you reference me. Um, you know, it varies, again, from state to state, the regulations as well as the client. Now, in the situation, I'm very familiar with the Temple area. There are actually three campus police departments in that area. UPenn, uh, Drexel as well are there. So the police officers uh, at those universities also have contract security that provide physical security. And they're limited as to what they can do and what they can get involved in. The company that was hired uh, by that lady um, they had no authority on the public street whatsoever, none. It's much different than if they were on a piece of private property. So while they're patrolling public property, if they were to get involved, and there's a situation that just happened in Denver where a security officer on the way to his job intervened in what he thought was an accident and wound up getting shot, he was critical for several weeks, and now the insurance company won't pay his medical bills because he wasn't on the company property. So it's a lot different than people, you know, can believe. The other thing that is really not recognized very well is that it's a very dangerous job. We have a full-time news department in our organization. This year so far, 71 security officers have been murdered on duty. Last year, 89 were murdered. And there are thousands that are assaulted every year. So... They do intervene when they legally can, but they're, you know, it, it just is very different. Each, each incident is going to be different. We're talking to Rick McCann, the CEO of Private Officer International and Times' Alana Samuels. I'm Jen White. You're listening to 1A. In April, Alana, a security guard at a Walgreens in San Francisco, fatally shot a man for suspected shoplifting. The San Francisco DA chose not to file charges against the security guard. The family of the man is now suing the security company, the guard, and Walgreens. What do you think this case will teach us in terms of liability in the private security space? Yeah, it's really hard because you do have, as Rick said, um, these guards are just out there and it's not very safe for them, especially if they don't have a lot of training. Um, and so you have these situations. Uh, this this isn't the only instance of a situation where a security guard shot someone and you know claims self defense. And your heart goes out to both sides because you think you know that guard didn't feel safe, and obviously that person did not deserve to die for for shoplifting. Um, and and so I think we're really gonna see who's gonna be held 
responsible. I think one of the things that's really hard is that it's often not the company that employed the security guard that's held responsible. And it's often not the secu- the company that even employs the person that's held responsible. It's the individual themselves. So just think you're someone, you get a job as a security guard and something happens when you're on duty, your company is maybe not going to really back you up. And, you know, that's something that I think we really need to be thinking about and looking looking at as, as the industry grows. So the, the guard themselves may not have any protections if something happens on the job. They'll be heard, held personally liable or responsible. Rick, what kinds of protections do these security guards have if they are injured uh, while they're on the, while they're patrolling or, or they're working to protect a business? What kinds of protections are extended to them? All 50 states require that employers with at least five employees um, carry workers' compensation, which covers their medical bills 100%, as well as a percentage of their salary. Unfortunately, small security companies and even some mid-sized companies don't always carry that insurance, and it has left a number of security officers just in recent years um, fending for themselves. As far as the liability issue, again, the security company is required to carry liability insurance but don't always do that. So the security officer themselves are pretty much uh, left, you know, holding the back and they're responsible and and oftentimes named in those lawsuits. We'll hear from an an activist in Raleigh, North Carolina. After the break, he has concerns about private security guards um, patrolling parts of downtown Raleigh. Alana, what have you learned about the way cities approach contracting these services and and how they're looking at the accountability piece of this puzzle. Yeah, I'm not sure how closely they are looking uh, at the accountability piece. I think you have a lot of cities like Charlotte, for instance, Santa Monica, California, where you have citizens who are very upset about the use of private security guards who will maybe go to a city council hearing and, and say something. But um, for instance, in Charlotte, um, you had some people come to the hearing where they had allied security. Uh, They were renewing the contract and, you know, not a whole lot of people go to or follow city council meetings. And they renewed the contract, even though um, the mayor pro tem was was really against it and was advocating for more money for the for the for the police department. So a lot of time this just comes down to how much money these cities have and what they're willing to spend it on. And, you know, not so much about whether the security is effective or not. We're hearing from many of you who work in private security. A member of the 1A Text Club shares, I am a private security officer. I'm a middle-aged lady who has always had service jobs. It's caretaking a property. You do for the client what you'd want done for your own house. We watch for water leaks and deal with people. There are problems with the industry. It attracts a lot of macho poop heads, and it doesn't pay a living wage. And another member of the Text Club writes, I was an account manager for a private security firm. I've seen the best, most conscientious officers, and I've seen some that lived up to every stereotype ever about security guards. A lot depends on the company themselves, how well they train new officers, weeding out the worst, and how good they are about retaining the best. Alana, when we look at the regulatory environment for private security, what's what's the state of the regulatory environment, I guess, is the question. (laughs) <laughs> well, it really varies by states and even by cities in some cases. Um, you know, you have places where there have been incidents in recent years starting to crack down and require that there's, you know, some de-escalation training or certain types of training. But again, even the places that require training, uh, like California, for instance, it's very hard to enforce um, because it's not like all the private security guards report to one place where they can check licenses. They're really spread out all across the state. Um, and so, you don't have a lot of requirement for training in in many states and even the states where you do have requirements it's hard to make sure that everyone's following those rules we're discussing private security being used in place of police with times alana samuels and rick mccann the ceo of private officer international so to come the city of raleigh north carolina is hiring armed security guards but some are pushing back we hear from a concerned city advocate i'm jen white this is 1a
Now back to the growing use of private security guards as their presence overtakes the number of police officers on the street. We're hearing from many of you. I'm a Marine Corps veteran, but I see increasingly with the security forces and the police that they're trying to become like a military operation. And our job was to train to fight enemy combatants. And the local people and the citizens are not enemy combatants. You know, their job should just be there for security and to help law-abiding citizens. We also heard from Zachary, who emails, I'm a law school graduate, originally from Culver City and currently living in the D.C. area. I returned to the executive protection field following two failed attempts at the bar. It's a growing field, recession-proof, and calls for physical and mental prowess. We're here with Rick McCann, the CEO of Private Officer International. That's an association for security and law enforcement professionals. He's also a police officer with 45 years in law enforcement and is a security company owner himself. Also with us, Alana Samuels. She's an economic correspondent with Time and wrote a three-part series on the private security industry. And now let's bring in one more voice. Joining us from Raleigh, North Carolina, is Kerwin Pittman. He's a social justice activist and the director of policy and programs at Emancipate NC. He's also the founder and executive director at Recidivism Reduction Educational Program Services. Kerwin, welcome to 1A. Thank you for having me. So last week, private security guards began patrolling parts of downtown Raleigh. Downtown Raleigh Alliance is a nonprofit organization working to revitalize the area, and they hired unarmed security guards with body cams. First, Kerwin, just describe this area for us. Yes, this area is an area where a lot of unhoused people um, congregate, as well as individuals who suffer from mental health illness, as well as a high population of substance abuse Um, issues with individuals. And so um, it is is extremely problematic in my view to, you know, hire security, especially uh, armed security as the city is is planning to do without uh, the scope of their work and job being put out to the public. Like what is the extent of their enforcement? Um, What is the extent of their authority that they will have over the the people? It it just seems like a a recipe for disaster waiting to happen. Now the the decision to have private security came after a week after a 15-year-old was shot downtown. Local station WRAL writes that Raleigh Police Department still have about 80 vacant positions. What are you hearing from community members in terms of their concerns around safety? So what we're hearing from community members is uh, we should be investing more in crime reduction strategies external of law enforcement and those acting in the semblance of law enforcement. And so what that actually means is if someone has uh, the flu, right, uh, we're not going to treat the symptoms of the flu. We're going to actually treat the flu itself to get rid of the issue. And so what that means is actually investing in the people in those areas to try to revitalize those areas and help those citizens who are suffering in those areas so crime can be reduced. Clearly, uh, it, is a, it is a problem nationally with uh, recruiting law enforcement. And so we have to think of other strategies external of hiring more police, I'm um, giving the police more money and now hiring private security that security that acts in the semblance of police, but really has no authority. Rick, what do you think are some of the issues around using private security to oversee so many downtown areas across the U.S.? Both our organization, as well as several other organizations that um, security and law enforcement are members of, have worked over the last five years to train security officers nationwide in de-escalation and communication. Of course, there's a lot of problems across the country with poverty and people with mental health. Those issues cannot be addressed by private security. What can be addressed is where there's incidents of laws being broken, trespassing. Uh, I'm very familiar with that Raleigh area because we're actually based in Charlotte. And so I'm very familiar with Raleigh. And unfortunately, private security does have limited authority. And um, they do need to be armed because they are often dealing with armed suspects. Uh, You know, you can go to our news blog or our newsletter and see every day security officers are being stabbed, shot, beaten. And when you're addressing someone who doesn't respect police, how can you expect that they're going to respect security? So security needs to be better trained, and and we're uh, attempting to do that nationwide. And I just want to be clear here. The decision to hire security 
by a local nonprofit group happened as the city of Raleigh is moving forward on plans to hire armed private security to patrol the transit center. Carmen, what are your biggest concerns with that plan? So my biggest concerns uh, with those plans is when you equip individuals with the tools like a gun, um, they're going to have the high potential to use that tool. Right. And so one of my main concerns is private citizens um, trying to attempt private citizens arrest or attain other private citizens. Um, and it's given me heavy reservation and has the strong potentials of, of companies deputizing individuals uh, with the mentality of the likes of George Zimmerman. Um, and so it, it kind of it, it gives me great pause and great reservation um, to think that individuals who may couldn't cut it as law enforcement join uh, these security firms um, that may not be vetting and training these individuals correctly um, and just targeted uh, black and brown people in these areas uh, with, 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 with a weapon. And I'll to be completely honest with you. We did contact the city of Raleigh about this decision. They sent an email saying, quote, the city is currently in the process of hiring private security, but we have not done so at this point. This effort will be used to supplement our Raleigh Police Department, not in place of them, end quote. Alana, as you were reporting this story, what did you hear around the biggest concerns, especially if we're talking about armed security? Yeah, I think what Kerwin said is is um, a lot of what I heard is that there are problems that are not going to be solved with a gun, you know, especially mental health issues. And you have people who maybe don't have a whole lot of training who are armed, um, who are going to be having to deal with these problems and, and this isn't kind of in their bailiwick. Um, so I think a lot of a lot of cities are saying, you know, maybe we actually need to spend more money to address the root of the problem, not just kind of put a Band-Aid and put private security. But they're also facing a lot of resistance to spending more money. You know, we're in a time when there's really high inflation and people don't want to spend more money on anything, much less, you know, on something like mental health services for homeless people. And so I think, you know, until we decide to address the root of the problem, we could have more of these issues um, with private security having to deal with problems that that really aren't aren't theirs to deal with. We're hearing from so many of you this hour. Dina texts, I personally feel the need, felt the need rather, to hire private security to secure my home when I moved out of it. I knew I would be away for a couple of weeks and it was worthwhile to pay a private security patrol while I was gone. It was expensive, but well worth the relief of worry. Carla emails, I work in a major hospital. Unfortunately, healthcare workers are a target for violence by visitors and patients. As a Jew, my synagogue is a target for anti-Semitic groups. We need security for our protection, sadly. We also got this email from Heather who says, I was maced by a security officer at a convenience store where there is a heavy presence of homeless people. I witnessed a security officer approach a man from behind and grab his arm. I loudly commented from within my car that the security guard was a bully and he promptly maced me. He got me directly in the eyes. I fell to my knees, blinded and vomiting. I was terrified. I blindly drove across the street and called 911. The security guard told the police I had attempted to hit him with my car and he had acted in self-defense. Alana, you know, we're seeing people with mixed experiences of private security, but what's becoming clear over the course of our conversation is that there's an issue with pay, the regulatory environment is unwieldy at best, and then there's this issue around training. Who's overseeing what happens in private security, either at a state level, or is there any federal oversight at all? No, there's really no federal oversight that I know of. It's really uh, a state-by-state basis. And it's often kind of local governments, you know, who have a lot going on right now dealing with this. You know, you do have the companies that employ people. Um, They don't want their, they don't want to be in the news for their security guards doing something wrong. So, you know, they may attempt training, but again, that costs money. And Sometimes that's not money that they have, depending on, you know, what what they're getting paid. So I think a lot of this really comes down to finances and what we're willing to fund and not fund um, in terms of training and and uh, vetting people. We're talking to Alana Samuels with Time, Rick McCann, the CEO of Private Officer International, and Kerwin Pittman, the Director of Policy and Programs at Emancipate NC. I'm Jen White. You're listening to 1A. Kerwin, in your conversations with the city or city officials, what are they saying about the need for this armed private security in Raleigh? 
Um, at this moment, they haven't actually said um, why. And from my understanding, some of the counselors are not in favor of hiring um, on private security. And so that is a conversation that we would definitely have to uh, get into sooner rather than later. Um, the, the act to hire this private security was not addressed or discussed openly in the public. Uh, it was done kind of behind closed doors, which is another issue. Um, but I think most importantly, we fund um, law enforcement even more every year. Um, and clearly we cannot arrest our way out of the issues that are going on across the country. And so we have to think about external strategies outside of law enforcement to reduce these types of crimes and crimes across the country. Um, but most importantly, we have to invest in the people in order to make that happen. And so that is the mind shift and the mindset that I would like to see the municipality of Raleigh take on. And it seems like they may be turning in that direction with other programs they're trying to implement. Now, Rick, you've said that the big security companies sell quantity, not quality. What do you think needs to change in order to improve the quality of the private security industry? Currently, only 38 states have some type of mandate for training requirements, um, and those are minimal at best. Some states in the last few years have increased training requirements. North Carolina, armed security, many of them are police officers, and they're not public police officers, but they're private police officers under a statute called Company Police 74E. They go through the same basic law enforcement training as any municipal police officer, and they're fully accredited, and they have full arrest authority. And that's where many states have begun going to for armed security. They're so so I, I just want to be clear really quickly, accreditation and arrest authority, but what about the accountability piece of it? Who are they accountable to? Their employer and their client. But because they are law enforcement, should they do something out of line, they'd be responsible to that state um, oversight that oversees all municipal law enforcement. How helpful do you think it would be to see regulation happen either federally or to have a more consistent regulatory environment from state to state? So there is no federal oversight for security and there is no federal requirement for specific law enforcement training. It's on a state by state basis. Although many states train on certain topics, um, the hours are different. One state may require 900 hours for a basic law enforcement academy and the other may require 400. And so even with law enforcement, it's different from Jurisdiction of the jurisdiction. We got this email from Ben who says, I live in Baltimore directly across the street from Johns Hopkins University, the city's largest employer. They have gone, uh, they've gone from patrolling private security to creating their own private police force. My concern for institutional private security is that this will be normal progression. Private police forces. How do citizens hold them accountable? And, and Rick, you, you gave us an explanation about what private police are, but I think that accountability question is outstanding for some of our listeners. How much variation is there from state to state? I think you said in North Carolina, they're still responsible to the state agency that oversees policing, but is that consistent across the country? No. The first police agent, private police agency in the U.S. was Yale University. They began their own police force in 1894. Um, Across the country, as with many professions, it's regulated by the state. So what the state mandates um, is going to be different. The oversight is going to be different as well. Now in Philadelphia, we were just talking about that, three campuses downtown, two of them are private. Drexel and Temple are private universities. They both have a private police agency, but their authority and their training is mandated by the state, just like if they were a Philadelphia police officer. Um, I do believe that there needs to be more regulation and more training, and I see that happening, but it's kind of happening slow. Alana, ultimately, what do we know about whether or not private security is making any of us safer? Yeah, I think it's a double-edged sword. I mean, if you talk to a gas station owner who hired a private security guard after, you know, getting robbed once a week, he's going to say he's a lot safer. But I think it also becomes this vicious cycle where people see guns or armed guards and they feel unsafe. And so they feel like they need to 
hire their own private security and we're just kind of arming up um, as a nation. And I don't know if that's necessarily going to solve our problems. Well, we'll leave the conversation there for now. That's Alana Samuels, an economic correspondent with Time. Also with us, Rick McCann, the CEO of Private Officer International. He's also a law enforcement officer and a security company owner. And Kerwin Pittman. He's a social justice activist and the director of policy and programs at Emancipate NC. He's also the founder and executive director at Recidivism Reduction Educational Program Services. Alana, Rick, Kerwin, thanks for joining us today. And thanks to all of you for sharing your stories with us as well. You heard from several members of the 1A Text Club across the hour. It's the fastest way to connect with us. Just head over to the 1A.org, click the Talk to 1A tab, and sign up to always be a part of the conversation. Today's producer was Michelle Harvin. This program comes to you from WAMU, part of American University in Washington, distributed by NPR. I'm Jen White. Thanks for listening, and we'll talk again tomorrow. This is 1A.